It's not yours, China. What exactly is North Korea up to? Plus some tips about traveling in Southeast Asia. All of these stories and more. The Chi Ranger podcast starts now. <music> Greetings and salutations, my excellent friends. I hope you're having a fantastic day. My name is Steve Miller, the Internet's Chi Ranger, and this is the Chi Ranger Podcast. And I would like to thank you for joining me once more this week here on YouTube on ChiRanger.com. And if you are downloading the audio from either ChiRanger.com or iTunes, thank you so much. Now, this week we do have a lot of stories and some exciting tips. But before we dive into that, I also want to thank you so much for all your support since I've gotten back back. I'm having a lot of fun doing the daily videos. The videos that I am uploading on the Chi Ranger channel are a lot of fun to go through. As you know, I spent a month in Southeast Asia traveling through so many different places that I was able to upload a video almost every single day while on the trip. However, on the trip, we also shot a lot of quote unquote proper travel videos. So now that I'm back in the typical video release schedule, Sundays, the podcast, Wednesdays, the walk and talk, Fridays, I'm going to be releasing these quote unquote proper travel videos. So we have a lot of videos coming out on Fridays that are not shot here in Korea. So if you're watching that YouTube channel and you're going, hey, isn't he in Korea? Or if you're watching both channels and you're wondering, well, why is the vlog video of the day shot in Korea, but the travel video on Friday from Southeast Asia? And that's why we did shoot a lot of videos. I think if I do it once per week, I will have videos coming out on Friday from Southeast Asia almost through to the end of March. So not a whole lot of videos. I may decide to split it up a little bit and include some different Korean videos. Uh, Joe and I are going to go to a few fun locations. I will be giving some travel tips about Korea coming out fairly soon. So those may be pushed back. Uh, if you have been following following me on Google Plus or on the Chi Ranger Adventures Facebook page, I did post a kind of a teaser video for Out and About. And this, as I mentioned last week, is the full length 30 minute or so travel video show that I am, well, producing. I'm doing it myself and I've just started working on that. So I think this week there will be a walk and well, I know this week there's a walk and talk because I've already shot it, uploaded it. It's, it's there. Uh, but next week there may not be a walk and talk simply because I want to have the time to edit that together. So all of that being said, I'm really excited to be back in the thick of things. School starts on March 3rd for me, and I'm looking forward to seeing the students, seeing the classes that I have, and possibly doing some extra work with the university in terms of hopefully helping them with their broadcast department. Last semester, I had the opportunity to work with the student newspaper and generating some travel-related content, and I'm hoping to be able to expand that with their radio and television program. So it's kind of cool. I'm excited that the school year is starting up once again, and um, I, I really can't wait for it. I, I'm, I miss being in school, and I miss being around the students. They're such a great group of people. So all that being said, let's go ahead and get started with the news. Welcome back to the podcast, everyone. As we do every week, we start with news from the Koreas. And unfortunately, there is a great deal of news related to North Korea coming out this week. And a lot of it really isn't different from what we see month after month, year after year. It seems that North Korea continues to run their foreign policy out of the same playbook. Now, North Korea has canceled the U.S. invitation. It was going to meet with a very high level and uh, diplomat to discuss 
things in the area to possibly discuss the release of Kenneth Bay. But once again, they've canceled the invitation, citing that the forthcoming military exercises between South Korea and the United States between February 28th and April 18th are an unnecessary provocation. Now, this is the same military drill that we saw last year that really ramped up the tension here on the peninsula. And again, we see North Korea doing the same thing year after year. It just seems that they try to coax everyone in the region to think that things are calm. And then they use any excuse to ramp up the rhetoric. And that's exactly what they've done this time. So unfortunately, it doesn't look like there's going to be any kind of meeting between the United States or really any U.S. friendly foreign powers in the near future that could possibly see a release for Kenneth Bay. Also, with North Korea, satellite information from 38 North at John Hopkins University has revealed the following, quote, Recent commercial satellite imagery indicates that North Korea is nearing completion of modifications to the gantry at the launch pad of the Sohei Satellite Launching Station. Now, this is fairly interesting for a number of reasons. Number one, we've known for a long time that North Korea is pursuing launch vehicles, long-range launch vehicles, and we've also known that they've been really trying to get these vehicles up and running. They had some failures last April that pretty much put the whole program on in. Now, this work hasn't been in the blind. It's, it's been well known, and that's why these satellite images, commercial satellite images at that, show that the work is at completion, uh, near completion. But this is what is interesting. Now, it may be that the rockets that they're going to fire are an updated or an adapted version of the Ukrainian Cyclone 4. Now, this missile could carry payloads of up to 500 kilograms if weaponized and it could fly some 10,000 kilometers, meaning it would be able to launch and strike targets on the mainland United States. So, we'll have to find and see what North Korea really does. I don't know if I would see this class of missile launch. They really haven't been able to launch more of a medium range missile yet. So to go from short range to this colossal range might be too big of a step. But keep in mind, they were able to get a missile, or a rocket rather, to go into orbit before South Korea. So it's not outside the realm of possibility. Should they launch this kind of missile? And if so, it'd probably be soon, since they are also ramping up for possible nuclear tests as well. If there is another nuclear test, if there is this long-range missile test, expect to see pretty much the same behavior that we saw last year during this time. We're going to see lots of rhetoric thrown around. We're going to see a lot of media coverage in the area. And there's a good chance that we could see tensions on the peninsula rise yet again. Now, throughout all of this, the military here in South Korea has said they don't see any movements, they don't see any change in posture from North Korea. So the chance that there is some kind of looming danger is pretty small. Or if there's an attack, it doesn't really appear that. So to be worried, if you're here in South Korea and you think, well, maybe I should be worried there's going to be a missile test, there's going to be a nuclear test, don't. There's just really no signs, no reason to be concerned. Finally, from the Koreas, we have another story about the Kaesong Industrial Complex. Now, this is the joint fabrication facility in North Korea, just north of the DMZ, about 10 kilometers north of DMZ. Now, if you recall, last year it was shuttered. The 56, 53, 56,000 North Koreans were called home. It was closed for five months. And then it only reopened because the South Korean companies that still had materials there threatened to walk. So then all of a sudden, North Korea rushed in and said, hey, let's work things out. They did. They're open. 
it's been open for a while now. There's actually been some progress. There looks like there's going to be the internet there. They're working on ways to make it easier for workers from South Korea to go across the border to get into the plant using RFID chips and cards. But now North Korea is pulling another little thing. You see, workers from North Korea at the plant get paid $60 a month, about. So North Korea is now saying, hey, they deserve a $30 a month raise to $90 a month. And I have mixed emotions about this. Now, first of all, it should be said that these types of negotiation in terms of compensation for North Korean workers in the operational handbook for Kaesong, these negotiations are only to take place during the month of August. It's February right now, so it's six months way too early. But on the other hand, I, I really feel for these North Korean workers. The reason why I say that is one of the reasons why all these South Korean companies are working there or, or have their fabrication there is because the labor is cheap. If you think about it, they're paying $60 a month. Let's just say $100 a month for a North Korean employee. They would have to pay a South Korean employee at least $1,000 a month, maybe $2,000 or $3,000. So they're, they're getting about 10 workers in North Korea for every one employee they could have here. Plus, the South Korean government is giving them some incentives for actually doing business there. So the cost of doing business at Kaesong is so financially advantageous to these South Korean companies that I really think they should be paying the North Korean workers there more. They're just saving so much money. And they also get the to reap the benefit of having this great PR value because they're working with North Korea to try and promote unity, to try and promote unification, when really it's about the bottom line. It really is, or else they would have just walked away. There's just so much financial gain for them to be able to work there. Now, personally, I think it's a bad idea. I think that you're giving too much money to the North. How much of that $60 or $90 or $100 actually goes to the person? I don't know, because the average employee wage for North Korea is like half of that. So workers at Kaesong are making a ton of money in comparison to other folks. So what will happen? I don't know. Personally, I would still love to see Kaesong close down. I think it gives too much power to North Korea. I think it raises too much in the ways of hopes for South Koreans. And it just gives North Korea too much control over the work environment. The plant is in North Korea. They control who goes in and who goes out. And as we saw last year, they can just shut it down anytime they want to. No matter what the rules are in place, they don't have to follow them. And that's shown right here with not following through with the operational guidelines to wait until August to negotiate pay. So my recommendation, as always, has been to pull out of Kaesong and work smart. Don't put that kind of financial risk in North Korea. All these companies were saying that, oh, if we don't get bailed out by the government, we could go bankrupt. And a lot of the companies that did ultimately pull out, they did so because they lost business, because the work environment was so uncertain. So we'll see what happens with that. Personally, I would love to see the workers get paid more only if they actually get to retain that money. Now, moving on to East Asian news. This is a fairly complicated story. This is a fairly interesting story. And this is one from Japan where various policymakers are calling for better relations with South Korea. Now, Japanese Foreign Minister Fumio Kishida, uh, Kishida told reporters in Washington, D.C., alongside with Secretary of State John Kerry, that Tokyo wants to mend fences and develop better relations with South Korea. Now, I am all for that. The people in the region, and when I say the people, I mean the governments in the region, that's South Korea, it's Russia, it's Japan, it's the various ASEAN countries, they all need to work together. 
This is a huge economic area and you really need to focus and work smart and stay together to make sure that everyone's moving in the same direction. There's just too much going on and China, from a strategic standpoint, could be seen as a threat. However, President Park Geun-hye here in Korea has said that unless Japan changes the way that they view history and admits that they committed atrocities and atones for them, there's just no point in talking with them. And I think that is a shame because it stifles the road to progress. Secretary of State John Kerry is here in with uh, is, is in the region, is in Korea, was here the, the other day, and he said that Korea needs to move past, come to the present, put the past behind you, and work in the present to mend ties with Japan. And immediately the foreign minister said, well, basically as soon as Japan recognizes the past. And that, it's, it's, it's not going to happen. Japan has its view and we've seen that with several statements, both from the new NHK uh, chairman, we've seen it with Prime Minister Abe, and we've seen a very different point of view from South Koreans and South Korean governments. And the two darts aren't even on the same page. And as long as you're not talking to one another, there's no way to mend that gap. And it's really sad because these two countries have so much in common and so much at stake regionally. To have heads of state, to have governments not talking to one another is just a waste. And Korea needs to also take into consideration what the past is. We, we've taken this past year, there was a huge controversy here regarding school textbooks, specifically history textbooks. And the government didn't like what was in the textbook. They said it was too controversial. They said it was uh, too right-wing or, or too progressive. Uh, it's an interesting choice of words because I wouldn't have worded it that way. But anyway, uh, these textbooks essentially we're quote unquote giving too much credit to Japan in, in terms of developing the school system, the uh, commercial uh, transportation infrastructure, etc. And they had it just wiped. They had different democracy movements classified as a uh, situation or the government classifies it as a riot, but the book classified it as an, as an uprising or a disturbance. And they didn't like the wording of that. And one of the things that Park and Hay has, has said is that she wants history as it's presented in textbooks and to be reviewed as, sir, more or less, uh, I want to say neutral or objective is, is the best word. And she's called for regional folks to come together from different countries to put forward a regional unbiased account of history. And I just don't see that happening, not from South Koreans, not from Japan because there are certain parts of the history that neither country wants to acknowledge and try to quote unquote beautify to make their own version seem more appealing. And if if Korea wants Japan to fully acknowledge atrocities and wrongdoings it committed between 1910 and 1945, then it also needs to look back and look at how it describes its own history up through this period. Uh, also, uh, the United States has made a monumental shift in the way that it is going to have its presence known here in Asia. And what I mean by that is up until now, it's been the standpoint of the United States that it doesn't get involved in territorial disputes. However, recently that all changed. The United States first, for the first time, proclaimed in a very clearly defined statement that it unilaterally rejected China's claim that it controlled nearly 90% of the South China Sea. Now this, in effect, gives supports to territorial claims by Japan, the Philippines, Vietnam, Malaysia, Taiwan, and Brunei. And it'll be interesting to see how this proceeds. Interesting to observe how this proceeds, because this is a major shift in United States policy here in the, in, in the region. And it could upset things with China. And we'll see what happens with the Senkaku Dayu dispute. We'll see how things uh, progress between Korea and China with its disputes. How it really affects 
the complaints that the ASEAN countries have with China. And that will be the thing that I th will be watching probably the most closely. Because right now, up until now, China has really refused to address these disputes on a collective basis with the various ASEAN countries, Vietnam, Philippines, etc., saying that it's willing to discuss the matter, but only one-on-one, -on -one, with the United States throwing its weight behind, essentially, everyone else's position, it may actually force China to have a collective arbitration. Only time will tell. That's it for this week's news. To get the links to all of these stories, you can click on the annotation or the link in the description box and surf on over to chiranger.com. <music>
of the actual true transaction rate for our hard currency into foreign currency. And what I mean by that is that there's the true forex rate. So we always try to use dollars. It's the easiest thing for us to communicate back and forth with and has a more stable currency value than say the yuan. So if something on the website says, hey, it's one dollar is this much in local currency. That's the best you're going to get. That's that's the bank rate right there. That's the pure bank rate. That's not what you're going to get at stand X, Y or Z. So when you change money, you have to really see what's the best rate out there and is it going to be different or how close is it to what I can get with a credit card, even with the extra percent? And that's what you have to pay pay close attention to. And when you change money, and I can't stress this enough, when you change money, you really have to shop around. One of the first questions we always ask when we get to a new place is, where's the best place to change money? And we will change a little bit of money at the airport just to get some local currency, but we usually wait until later to actually change more of our spending money because the better rates are always away from the airport. And even if you find a place that has quote unquote a good rate, shop around. While we were in Thailand, I, I, I was actually amazed at how many people were going to places and handing over two, three, four hundred dollars in cash at a place that was quite frankly, it was awful. The exchange rate was awful but they didn't do their homework because two stalls down there was a place saying uh, buying dollars for a lot more money so if you're changing money you gotta shop around uh, with exchanging money and this is the first time I've ever seen this while traveling uh, we first saw it in Thailand we saw it a few other places but they had different exchange rates for different values of bills. So this is particularly with US dollars. One in five dollar bills, dollar bills had one transaction rate, exchange rate. Tens and twenties had a different transaction rate. And fifties and a hundred had another transaction rate. And the fifties and a hundred was the closest to the absolute value in the Forex. So if you're changing money, if you're gonna go bills and change cash. Uh, just be aware of that. It seems that now higher denominations are more preferable than the lower denominations. And also, I did see that travelers' checks across the board always had the highest rate. It was always on par with, say, like a hundred dollar U.S. bill. But no matter where you are from, if you were using a travelers' check, it was always the highest value possible for the transaction. Now. In terms of ATMs, and this is the one thing I have not done uh, because my per personally, my ATM card here in Korea is not valid abroad. Even though it's part of one of the big networks, the Visas, the Sirius, the Plus, whatever you want to call it, it won't work in a foreign ATM. I did try just to see what it would be like, but it, it wouldn't allow me to actually withdraw cash. And that's one of the dangerous things too, is that if you travel abroad without cash, without a traveler's check, and are relying on your ATM card to withdraw from a uh, cash machine overseas, you may run into trouble. I have had friends that have traveled to foreign countries, and even though they would walk up to a quote unquote global ATM and put their ATM card in, it wouldn't give them money. The, the other dangerous thing is if you're relying on your credit card to get cash advances, that's it's fine in an emergency, but it's very dangerous otherwise because in addition to the like 25% interest you pay on a cash advance, you pay a transaction fee to the bank and a transaction fee to your credit card company to withdraw the cash. It's just a lot of money and really not worth it. <coughs> <coughs> Mm. Oh, no, we gotta withdraw that one. Some other things to keep in mind is that when you're traveling around, please carry smart. You don't want to carry around a lot of cash and you don't want to flash your cash either. So typically what I think is probably the most 
Uh, wise thing to do is only carry enough with you that you need for that day. And if you have different bill denominations, separate them. And what I mean is that typically in my wallet, I have my bills lined up nice and neatly. The tens, the fives, the ones, if I'm in the United States, maybe a few fifties, a few twenties, a hundred, whatever. You know, they, they're all lined up in ascending order. But when I travel throughout Southeast Asia, I don't do that. Uh, I'll carry enough that I need for that day. And I have all denominations folded together, meaning that let's say we have a, uh, where were we? Uh, you, let's use pesos because pesos are, are easy. So I have a 20 peso bill and they're all folded together. And then I maybe have a few 50 peso bills and they're all folded together. And I have a few hundreds and I have a few 500 peso bills and they're all folded together. And then I put a plastic card, maybe it's my room key card, or maybe it's an ID, a driver's license or something, next to the highest denomination. So it becomes a stack. So if someone asks me to pay for something, I can reach into my pocket and count away from the plastic card. Oh, this is my 500. Oh, this is the hundreds. These are the fifties. Oh, I need to pay 80 pesos. I can take out one, two, fifty dollar, uh, fifty peso bills, hand it to the person and never have to look inside my pocket or look at my money. And when I get the change, I just put it in the other pocket without having to refold everything together. That way no one around knows how much money I'm carrying and no one really knows where exactly it is. I think it's just a smart way to do it. Uh, it's something that Joe taught me. Uh, since I'm used to carrying a wallet. So uh, there's uh, one recommendation. Also, while you're traveling throughout Southeast Asia, negotiations are key. A lot of times you can get great deals uh, on tours if you want to go that way by befriending folks at the front desk. They will maybe make some phone calls on your behalf. Maybe they have someone who works in that industry and they can cut uh, cut the price on whatever the printed price is for a, a deal. Also, with tuk-tuks uh, in, in Bangkok and Thailand, tuk-tuks are just, uh, they're bad news. Always take a metered taxi. It's just the easiest way to go. Uh, in another deal in Singapore, as time is running out, in Singapore, uh, this is something that's really cool. They have a tourist travel card, and it is actually available for locals, but it, it's really, really cool and allows you to get around really, really easy. Essentially, you pay a $10 deposit and then determine if you want to use it for one, two, or three days, and there's different fees along with that. But it's unlimited. It's for buses. It's for, for subways. It's for everything. And it just allowed us to travel freely throughout Singapore. It was amazing. So if you're in Singapore, going to Singapore, and you're going to be there for a while, I would say that is uh, something to, to try as we activate Siri here. And finally, uh, one thing I would say is walking is awesome. Yes, walking is awesome. Walking is probably one of the best ways to get around. You see more, you keep the pounds off because when you're on vacation, you want to eat, you want to drink, you want to have a good time. So walking really helps to get you familiar with the area. Of course, be smart with that, but it just saves so much money because you don't have to pay for rides here and there. So uh, those are some tips for traveling in Southeast Asia. If you have anything to add, any questions, please, Drop it in the comment section and I'll be back in just a second. Well, my friends, that will just about do it for this week's episode of the Chi Ranger podcast. Thank you so much for sticking around. If you have any feedback for me, please shoot me a message at podcast at chiranger.com or drop a comment down below. Now, to keep up with everything that I do, all my social media links are located either in the sidebar over at chiranger.com or in the description box here on YouTube. But until next week, thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for listening. Remember to be true to yourself and always be awesome. The Chi Ranger podcast is written and produced by Steve Miller and licensed under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial No Derivatives 4.0 International License. Morning Blue was written and produced by Josh Woodward.